Content warning. This podcast is intended for a mature audience. Contains graphic descriptions of violence and explicit language. Hello, you're listening to Pods of the Multiverse Season 4. We're playing 5th Edition D&D, and I'm Jimmy, the DM for our game in Eberron. Joining me are three of my best friends. I'm Andy, and I will be playing the Warforged Green Warden, named the Green Warden. <laughs> <laughs> My name is Jeff B. I will be playing Alfonso Carlucci Roccatella, the rock gnome artificer. Uh, and I am Scala. I will be playing Istvan of Clan Gunvald, a dwarven smith and disciple of the Sacred Hammer. Nice. I'm so excited for this. All right. Welcome to season four. Hope you enjoy. Without any further ado. Here we go. This is a much anticipated time. The tribe's elders have been watching the night sky more intently. Long arcs of triumph and turmoil are played out between the constellations of dragon spirits above. The prophecy foretells that the great end approaches. How or when it will arrive, no one can divine. After the exodus will come a new era, one in which elves are no longer enslaved by giants, but command their own fate. In these times, there is much uncertainty about the future, for the prophecy, as far as the elves know, ends here. The druids, the oldest and wisest among the elven tribes, used the ancient wisdom of the dragons to create the Green Wardens, living, feeling constructs made from the elements of nature to guard the boundaries of the natural world and protect the elves from the ever-present threat of the giants. Now, they are tasked with freeing as many elven slaves as they can before the arrival of the end. Tonight, a force of several hundred Green Wardens is bearing down on a giant city where elven slaves await liberation. Andy, go ahead and describe your character. Oh, man. An enormous being, made of large rocks bound with roots and vines, with a glowing pale green light shining like eyes from within his brilliant stone-visored helm. A giant great sword hanging in his back, and a beautiful elvish cloak around his shoulders. Dozens of elvish druidic runes sharply etched across his stone body. He's slow to move, but quick to know the nature of things and people. Come, brothers, let us fulfill our part. All right. So your squad is overlooking this giant city from atop a ridge. The night is quiet, but there are hundreds of green wardens hidden just outside the city all along this ridge, waiting to make their approach. As you look up at the night sky, you can see all the different draconic constellations that you have been taught over the years of living with this tribe. In the middle distance, dense trees give way to sprawling pastures and farmland. The massive towers and spires of the city jut into the sky behind them, and one central spire rises high above the rest. There. Another green warden approaches your troop. He lowers his hood, which is a large mushroom cap, and he says, The plan is to approach the city using the trees as cover. So you're going to slip into the city using tree lines and sporadic bushes and shrubs to blend in with nature as you make your way to your target, which is a compound that houses at least a hundred elven slaves that are used for their adeptness with the magical artifice of the giants. Very well. How would you like to approach? I would like to just start off with a perception check. Get a lay of the land. Go for it. Awesome. That's going to be a six. <laughs> okay. So basically everything I described so far, you're up on this ridge and there are trees between you and this city that you can get pretty much into the city using these trees as cover. And you and your companions are pretty good at that, having lived in the jungles for a while. Step lightly, brothers. Through the trees we shall move. All right, so you have a pretty basic idea of where this place is that you're going to. So go ahead and give me a survival check as you make your way through these trees. Okay, that is a 17. Okay, yeah. On a 17, you are able to easily find your way through these trees pretty much right up to where you can see the edge of where these structures are beginning. And you're really quiet. Not a lot of people around other than you and your Green Warden companions who also move very quietly through 
this jungle. And you can see, as you approach the city from this direction, your target. This is a large compound surrounded by parallel bars very close together that rise very high up into the sky. And they enclose some structures within that you know to be the slave quarters. On a 17, you can make your way around and you find these huge gates. Do they seem barred or locked in any way from our vantage point? Guarded, perhaps? No, it's strangely abandoned, but the gates themselves seem to be closed tightly. Got it. Strangely abandoned. Now is our chance to strike. I will command the Green Wardens to proceed. All right. How would you like to get this gate open? Looks like Green Wardens aren't so good at that. I am thinking. (laughs) New character. Hold on. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> when all else fails, punch. I am weighing my options. This seems like it's supposed to be something we are trying to keep quiet as long as possible. I will draw my greatsword, and as quietly as I can, I gesture to the others to do the same. One chance. Let us fulfill the promise to our makers. And I'm overthinking this. I'm going to attack the gate. <laughs> All right, great. Punch! I can do a lot of offensive things, and that's about it. So, yeah, I'm just going to attack it. All right, go for it. It's going to be a 22. Yeah, that'll hit the gate. Sure. Awesome. Roll damage. I'll go ahead and use Divine Smite on this. You see dust and earth begin swirling around my sword. Leaves and seeds and other green matter begin glowing, and as I swing... That's going to be 11 slashing damage and 12 radiant damage. Wow, that's pretty good. And you can see that this divine strike with this radiant damage is sufficient to bend a few of these bars. And you feel that that is a space that's large enough for you to pass through. Cool. Can I give maybe a quick perception check to see if we were noticed? Absolutely. That's only a 10. You were, but you don't. Probably. Yeah, you don't know if there's anyone hiding around. But you look around at this scene, this huge compound. Now that you're up close, you can't really see the ends of these tall fences in either direction. You can barely see the top of this. This thing is so huge. But now that you've opened it, you can see inside various shacks and other small structures look kind of run down. You know what you're looking for. These are the slave quarters. Also, though, now that you're looking inside, you can see that there are a couple of giant statues just inside the gates here. Mm, uh Uh-oh. Yes. I want to roll some insight on those for sure. (laughs) So these are statues of two giants wearing ornate robes with crowns and a sword pointing towards the heavens. Mm, Yeah, I'm pretty suspicious of those. (laughs) Doesn't seem good considering the gate was unguarded to begin with punch the statues you didn't punch the gate <laughs> look i'm the one who does the punching here okay uh, can i roll like insight or arcana or something on those what are you trying to discern here about these statues basically if this is a trap okay go ahead and roll arcana oh nice that is a dirty 20 yeah on a dirty 20 you know that the giants are known for their artifice they make constructs mm-hmm. not unlike yourself in a lot of ways Mm -hmm. although you are of elven construction Mm -hmm. quite a bit different than these giant statues so probably on a 20 arcana this fits the bill you should move quietly or punch it not gonna do that (laughs) steady brothers surely these statues mean to defend this place i suppose we will continue being stealthy and proceed in the gate so as you enter the gate these two statues are here and just a little bit further are all of these shacks okay yeah we're gonna start looking around for elves we can save go ahead and roll investigation and if you're doing it stealthily roll stealth as well okay so i'll roll the stealth first this is with disadvantage and minus one that is an eight okay and the investigation that is a 15 okay So your stone feet on the stone ground, Mm. making quite a bit of noise right now. Sure. And still constantly keeping an eye to those statues. They don't seem to be moving at all. Intriguing. On a 15 investigation, you know that these shacks are definitely the homes of slaves. There's a few of them 
between you and your squad, you can go and start banging on doors if that's the way you want to approach this. It's up to you, really. I don't want to make any preventable noise. I'm not going to go around causing a ruckus, but I will go up and if there are doors or windows or anything, just see if I can see any actual people, if I can make eye contact with anyone. You can definitely surmise that there are elves inside of these shacks. You can see them. They're wearing plain clothing. Okay. And one notices you as you stick your head into this window. It's you. Friend elves, we have come to rescue you. Quickly now, quietly now. You're, you're here, but... They're expecting you. Uh Uh-oh. You can't be here. When they say that, I turn around to the statues, expecting this trap to be sprung immediately. That doesn't happen. Okay, I turn (laughs) back to the elves. Quickly, trap or no, the way is clear. You must flee. Right now? Are you sure? Is it safe? I just point to the open gates and the wilderness beyond. He goes into the next room and he comes back with a few others thank you thank you and goes out the door runs to the gate and as soon as he goes through this gate disappears among the trees and wild all right so that's one house down great i'm gonna continue in this fashion try not to cause a big commotion but group or individual at a time hush them into the wilds without trying to stir up any alarm Okay, so you go house to house, and you are ushering them to freedom, a few dozen of them, and they are just streaming towards these gates, disappearing as they pass these gates. And then, suddenly, the central spire in the middle of this city that you saw from the ridge and is still visible above some distant trees and buildings erupts with a beam of blinding light Uh shooting straight up into the sky. It goes up higher than you can even possibly see or imagine. It actually goes up through these constellations in the sky, causing them to scurry out of the way. Oh, shit. (laughs) Yeah. And so the constellations in that part of the sky part, which muddies the constellations and the cosmic order, and the whole sky is a little bit disturbed for a little while. You can roll Arcana. Yeah, I would love to. As I look up in horror, and that's going to be a 19 Arcana. The 19 Arcana, you still don't know what it is, but if it's something that's powerful enough to disrupt the constellations in the sky, this is something on a possibly cataclysmic scale, which the giants are known for. Ruin. Cataclysm. Green Wardens, we must hurry our pace. So as the whole area around you is bathed in this light, these statues come to life. Uh Uh-oh. One of them turns and points its sword directly towards you and your other Green Warden companions. Go ahead and roll initiative. Yeah, I was going to say, I'm going to fucking attack it as quick as I can. (laughs) And that's a 17. All right. How much bigger are they compared to us? These are huge. These are giant-sized. Okay. Life-sized giant statues. Right, right. And there are about how many wardens? There are a lot scurrying everywhere, facilitating the liberation process, but you are with a squad of six others. As they're coming to life, I look to all of the others who are not part of my squad, seeing that they are continuing. I usher the rest of my unit towards me, gesturing with a slow, large stone arm. Come, brothers. Let us defend our order. Alright, you're up first. Cool. I am going to bonus action, shield of faith, increase my AC by two, and then I am going to lead my green wardens approaching and attacking with my greatsword. Go for it. That is going to be a 21 to hit. That is definitely going to hit. And that is going to be 12 slash. You cut into this thing, and despite its size, pieces of it crumble off as you lash out with your sword. Two arms, green wardens. That's my turn. All right. So we've got now six green wardens who are going to swarm it and attack one at a time here with their great swords. These are green wardens of similar construction to you. So this one that turned its sword towards you is starting to look a little bit hurt as you guys are swinging into it. The other one has taken to attacking another mob of green wardens that's attacking it from a different direction. Okay. So it is its turn now. All right. And it is going to attack green warden near you. It's going to miss in a big way. (laughs) And it's going to attack again. 
and that one is going to hit a green warden right near you, and these are really huge hits. Okay. There we go. So I want to share this with everyone, actually. I just rolled three D8, and I rolled two eights. Mm. Oh, no. Anyway, that's 27 bludgeoning damage as it just comes right down on one of your companions. Yeah, I see my brother get smashed to rubble. Brother! I was hoping you'd be like, Gary! <laughs> Fuck <laughs> off. We are nameless. Love it. Excellent. I love that. All right, it's your turn. Okay. Wicked machination. I would like to use my action to dump 10 points of lay on hands into my greatly injured brethren. You see swirling green energy around my sword as I rest it on his shoulder, restoring that health. Thank you. And then as a bonus action... I would like to quicken, using my meta magic, a second level chromatic orb. All right. And I am going to choose acid range spell attack, and I think that's going to hit with a 24. Uh huh. That is 17 points of acid damage. Very nice. After I lay hands via my sword, I take my open other hand and unleash this swirling dark green orb of magic directly into this giant construct. And as I launch the orb, you see all of the runes on my body burst the same color, glowing as the spell. Awesome. Anything else? I am going to try and position myself in front of this thing. Say, hit me, you fool. That's my turn. Now your friends are going to go. That one's going to crit. That's very nice. nice. This thing is looking pretty rough. Yeah, so after your companions hit this thing a bunch, it's looking like it's barely holding itself up anymore. There's pieces of rock falling off of it. Its sword is in two pieces. Andy, in Green Warden voice, say, you ain't nothing but pebbles. <laughs> <laughs> Not gonna do that. That's fine. That's fair. One of the other ones will say it. <laughs> yes! You ain't nothing but pebbles. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah, as this fight is going on here, you see the other giant statue fighting this other mob of Green Wardens. It strikes one down, and he falls into a pile of rocks that just gets scattered all over this stone ground. No! That is the statue's turn. It's gonna try to hit you. Hell yeah. Yeah, that's 26 to hit. That'll hit, yeah. Yeah. Cool. That's 19 slashing damage as it brings its sword down right on top of you. I think I have to roll concentration on Shield of Faith. Let me do that now. I maintain. I am made of tougher earth than the villain. Excellent. Excellent. It's got one more attack, and that one's definitely going to miss. That's a big old miss. Okay. All right, your turn. Finish this thing. After proclaiming this construct to be a villain, I'm going to attack it. Only a 16 to hit. That's going to miss. Okay. That's my turn. Oh. <laughs> no. Yeah. All right. I can't really do much else with my bonus action that I haven't already done, so... All right. Then it looks like your bodies are going to finish the job. Oop. Or not. One misses. <laughs> one also misses. Uh-oh. That one is the same roll. That one hits. Cool. So all of your combined strength, you are able to hack away at this thing and really just chop it up into little rocks as it crumbles down. Awesome. Similarly, the other mob of Green Nordens is taking out the other statue around the same time. And as this conflict here comes to a close, you notice something up in this blinding light above the spire. Go ahead and make a perception check. That is a 12. Okay. On a 12, a speck is making its way across this huge white beam that's shooting up into the sky. I point up something within. As you look, another speck joins it. Uh Uh-oh. And then another. Uh Uh-oh. More and more and more. And now they're getting bigger. And you can see as these things approach, wings. Oh, fuck. (laughs) Do you want to do anything? Oh, man. Would my immediate instinct be that dragons are friends or not? Roll history. Okay. Untrained, that is a nine. Yeah. On an untrained nine, cosmologically, you're pretty much aligned with them. 
mm-hmm. you've never met one in real life, okay. and you know that they are incredibly powerful beings. Great. <laughs> Religion would actually bring it up to a 12. Would that make any difference? Sure. On a 12, you know that the whole religion of these constellations in the sky, these draconic spirits that swirl around in the constellations, comes from the ancient dragons. It was passed down to the elves through prophecy and through story, Mm -hmm. and ultimately came to your tribe and the Green Wardens. So the giants disturbing the Mm -hmm. cosmological Mm -hmm. order in this way Mm -hmm. is something that the dragons would take quite personally. Right. They come, the great dragons. We must make haste. So just as you say that, these dragons are getting closer and closer, bigger and bigger, and now there are too many to count. They're practically covering up this entire white beam. Fuck. And all at once, they unleash thousands of breath weapons. Wow. That just collapse this huge spire and the light goes away there's still this huge hole in the night sky where the white beam had been previously Mm. but the white beam itself is no more but the dragons do not yield they continue destroying every structure they can see we must finish our task we must secure every elf At this point, elves are running, scattering, green wardens are also running, Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. and the dragons fly right overhead, and with one last loud, roaring breath weapon, just completely destroy the entire area around you, and everything goes black. Hell yeah. In this darkness... (laughs) Well, better get your 3d6 out. (laughs) (laughs) So, green wardens... They don't sleep. Correct. They have never really been fully unconscious. And so here in this darkness, even though you can't see or hear or feel, you're still thinking. (sighs) Some time passes. What are you thinking about? My brothers. My druids. Elves. I hope we were enough. This place, this foul place, I hope it is never uncovered. Earth and stone, root and vine, protect this place. So, a being such as yourself has an interesting relationship with time, being made mostly of rock and Mm -hmm. other pieces of nature. And so a lot of time passes. You really don't know how long, but it's a lot of time. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But then suddenly you awake. Everything's still dark. You're having trouble moving. You can ultimately conclude you are buried under something. Mm. I'm going to try and get out. Yeah. Go ahead and roll athletics. That is going to be a 16. Yeah. On a 16, you are able to almost swim your way out of this huge pile of rocks that you're inside of. And as you peek your head out, you can see all around you, it's night, and this sea of rocks goes on in every direction for quite a while. Okay. Can I see any trees or anything, or is it all sort of the same ruins and debris as far as I can see? Roll investigation. That's a four. (laughs) On a four, you don't see much. Okay. Pretty dark. You can see that the area around this ruin has been warped, reclaimed by nature. Yes, there are some trees around, okay. but it is still very much the same place as before, a ruined city. Mm. Does it look like the central spire? Is that completely destroyed or does any part of it remain? You don't see it. Okay. I mean, you rolled a four. But yeah, I know. <laughs> after a little while, you do see some of the structures. Okay. I will begin looking around for anyone else. A roll perception. That's a 16. On a 16, there's not a single sign of anyone else. But on a 16, you do notice that many of the rocks around you have these draconic runic symbols on them. Not unlike the ones on you. Oh, shit. Can I roll insight or something on that? Do I think that these are the remains of the Green Wardens? These are the remains of the Green Wardens. Oh, fuck. I immediately take a knee in this scene. I rest my great sword down. (sighs) Brothers. And I just hang my head at this revelation. Yeah. 
pretty heavy moment. Yeah, it's pretty heavy. Anyway. I mean, it is. (laughs) As you're doing this, a bright glimmer in the sky catches your attention. Okay. What can I see? What does it look like? Roll religion for this one. Oh, no. That's a nat one. Total of five. Oh, my God. Distraught. They're distraught. I am distraught. Okay, total of five. Okay. I am distraught. Jimmy's, Jimmy's like, I can work with a five. Yeah, working yeah. with a five. Four gives me nothing. Four on that um, investigation like, check. Like, I'm like, so distraught, and I'm just going off the cuff here. When I place my greatsword down flat, this is wild even as I'm saying it, I take off my enormous stone helm such that all that is my head is just the single green will-o'-wisp light source. (laughs) That stays behind. (laughs) And I place my helm on my sword. If a light source could cry, I'm crying. Mm -hmm. On that five religion, just passively you know that that glimmer is within the constellation of Chronepsis. But on a five... You don't know what that means. Or you don't remember. You're too distraught to remember. Five? All right. <laughs> I mean, that's I what know, I roll I know, once. I know, I know. I'm just trying to have to reword Now you know how I feel when you roll once. <laughs> yeah, right. <laughs> no, no, no. You can start that to when you roll, because that is all yeah. Jimmy roll. <laughs> that's right. <laughs> you keep tempting fate like that, Jeppy. We're going to get crit to death. Mm. Yeah, that's fair. That's fair. At the very least, on this religion of five, looking up in the night sky, it takes you a little while to get your bearings, but you realize that the constellations are in completely different places from last time you looked up there. It's been a very long time since you have looked up at the sky. So this bright light grows brighter and brighter and brighter until this form of Chronepsis, this great fuck dragon is fully illuminated in the sky even though it's an outline of stars this blue shining light gives it form Mm. and this blue part of the sky resembles daylight in a way the light gets bigger and bigger and bigger until it streaks through the sky and lands nearby with an enormous beyond the tree line yeah i'm gonna pick up my the rest of my limbs and try and find where it landed yeah you put yourself back together and you walk in the direction of this crash site and let's tempt fate once more roll another investigation check to find this thing okay can it be literally any other check (laughs) you can make it nature or survival cool i'm gonna go with nature thanks okay (laughs) that's a 19 okay on that 19 you can figure out the direction that it fell and generally how far away it was and you come across this ruined structure made of these huge, great stone bricks with a big, wide open doorway and a glowing light within. Mm. Does the structure remind me of any of those giant structures? Oh yeah, for sure. I approach cautiously. As you approach, how close do you want to get to this? As close as it takes me to see something. Okay. You can see that something has crashed through the roof of this ruin Mm. and is now just in the middle of this room glowing. Still glowing. Glowing very brightly. Who goes there, friend or foe to elves? You don't get a response. Mm. I will get a little closer and see if I can see anything else. Okay. As you get a little bit closer, you can see that this is a large glowing crystal. Yes. Do I know anything about crystals? Roll history. Or religion. Thank you. That is a 13 million. 13 religion, you know that the constellations up above are part of the Ring of Sybaris, the Ring of Dragon Shards that surround the plain of Eberron. Welcome to Eberron, everyone. <laughs> <laughs> this is not the first time that you might have seen a Sybaris Dragon Shard fall down to Earth, but they don't usually come directly out of the eye of Chronepsis and light the whole night sky. Right. This one seems like it has some special significance. As you're standing here thinking all this, you hear some rustling in the bushes. I will turn around. It landed somewhere over here. I'm telling you, it was huge. Probably worth a lot of money. Two figures make their way towards you. They haven't seen you yet. Okay. I am going to, without revealing myself to them, call out, Who goes there? Do you hear that? Someone out there? Who's there? Can I get a look at them? Yeah. Perception check. That's an 11. On an 11, you don't know what orcs are, but you can see these two humanoid figures wearing plain clothing, two normal looking dudes. Okay. Tiny giants. (laughs) Go back from whence you came. 
as they rustle their way out of the bushes, they look directly at you and go, what the hell is that? Can I roll intimidation with that? Yeah, absolutely. <laughs> That's a 22. Run! <laughs> and they turn and just run directly back out into the trees. Hell yeah. What do you do next? Just sit on a step or something in this ruined place and stare at this crystal for a while. So this crystal is about the size of your head. Mm. And the longer you sit there looking at it, the dimmer it becomes. It starts to lose its brightness. Touch the rock. Touch the rock. I contemplate. Don't. Just do it. Touch. The impermanence of all things. (laughs) As I see it dim. Yeah, I'll pick it up. All right. Yes. Yes. There we go. (laughs) I'm going to take this thing with me. I don't want those tiny giants to get it. (laughs) Fuck those tiny giants. So as you're looking at it and you reach out towards it, you can see this golden crystal has these inscriptions in it. And as you look very closely at it, these are the same sort of inscriptions that are on you. Whoa. But these are very tiny. The entire crystal is just covered in these. There's a lot of information encoded into this thing. And as you pick it up, you feel yourself imbued with energy. Whoa. Wondrous magic. Hmm. Can I get a sense of anything specific, or do I just feel blatant power? The power within you that gives you your magical abilities is somewhat empowered by having this crystal in your possession. Cool. I leave this place and wander into the wild. As you wander into the wild, you stumble around for a bit. Roll survival. 21. No stumbling at all. No, (laughs) no stumbling at all. But even more striking on a 21, you find that even though you walk in pretty much one direction, you arrive back at the ruin. Strange, odd, unsettling. Very nice. All right. That's a good place to leave Warden for now. Sure. Alfonso, you arrived in the city of Sharn this morning, the latest stop on your journey. Your search for answers has led you to Kenneth Tower, one of the homes of House Kenneth, the dynastic mega corporation that manufactures everything from magic weapons to self-sweeping brooms. They are also the manufacturer of your magical prosthetic arm. Here at the foot of Kenneth Tower, a crowd of people and workwear shuffle listlessly in all directions. They carry a variety of mining tools, smithing implements, and lunch pails. They grumble as they push through and around your space. You're very much in the way. <laughs> cool. I'm glad to be in the way. I'm honored. So you're basically inside the lowest levels of Kenneth Tower here. The tower walls are made of these just enormous stone blocks, and there's iron beams that connect the inner workings of the floors and the rooms of this tower. How do you want to proceed? Do you want me to describe my character? That's a great idea. <laughs> okay. Oh, sorry. I was waiting for the cue. Jeffy, go ahead and describe your character. Thank you. <laughs> Short in stature, big in personality, a rock gnome hobbles along wherever he goes. It's hard to see him without a smile, and almost always he'll regale you with a tale about war or family. Alfonso, or as he will tell you, Alfonso Carlucci Rocatella, has always valued family. Even if Alfonso doesn't tell you all about family, you'll know just from looking at him. Whether he's scratching his curly brown hair or twirling his wiry mustache, you'll notice almost immediately that he's doing so with a mechanical arm. The arm, you begin to notice, will glow faintly once in a while, and that's because it has the spirit of his dead brother, Luciano, inside of it. Alfonso carries this weight with grace, kindness, and a sense of jubilee as he tries to find a way to bring his brother back, all while staying alive in such a big world. Very cool. So, here you are in Kenneth Tower, but it's not really how you expected it. You hear Kenneth and you think wondrous magical devices, but what you see is a bunch of shuffling laborers. What do you want to do? They're not paying me much mind, right? They're kind of just going about their business. Well, other than bumping into you, yeah. and grumbling, and moving around you. Where are they headed towards? In every direction. Every There's a direction. lot of openings and archways and stairways and doors. This is a very busy place you found yourself in. Okay. Do any of the doors or the entryways come off as a place where maybe they manufacture parts? Something that could give me a clue as to how this arm was fashioned? Yeah, sure. Go ahead and roll perception. Six. <laughs> On a six, you can see that there are some signs. There are some signs for stairs and some signs for lifts. You can't really figure out any particulars, especially not where specific products are manufactured. Okay. I'm going to head towards whichever stairway or entryway or lift is the most occupied and just see what's there. Imagine that 
more people heading to a place signifies more importance and something like a mechanical arm is probably a more valuable or important piece of the manufacturing arm of Kenneth, did you say? Yes, Kenneth. All right, yeah, I'll follow along with the biggest crowd and see where that takes me. Okay, on a six, you can vaguely make out that there do seem to be a really big crowd of people making their way towards the archways and the doorways that signify lifts. So you shuffle in that direction with the rest of them. And as you round the corner into this room, you see several dozen vertical rails that go up and down. They disappear up into the darkness of the upper levels of this tower. And every few seconds, a lift car screeches to a halt and another one zips out of sight. There are passengers standing in very long queues for every one of these lift cars. I'm going to get in line and try to make small talk with the person in front of me. What does this person look like before I start my small talk? This is a dwarf, a little bit taller than you. Perfect. He's got a scraggly beard and long black hair, and he is carrying a mining pick. He's wearing workwear, overalls, stand. Okay. Buongiorno, signore. This ceiling is very big. I've never seen something like this before. Back where I'm from, we simply do not have this. It is amazing. You work here. After you stop talking, he turns around and looks at you. Yeah. <laughs> that is magnificent. What do you do here? I would die for Alfonso. What a choice. <laughs> he gestures to the mining pick slung over his shoulder. You know, mining. <laughs> what a valuable trade you do. I, for one, am... Molto grateful. I work with minerals and materials all the time, at least I did back in my own town of Tervalistas, but it's good to see that this trade is carried on here. Mm. Where exactly does this line go? This line? Yes, this line. Down, forges, mines, you know. Ah, mamma mia, I do not think I want to go to the forges. Oh, I'm here, by the way, my name is uh, Alfonso Carlucci Roccatella. I'm here looking for a way to... He looks at his arm for a minute, doesn't really know exactly how to describe it. Learn more about my arm, this mechanical arm. It was given to me by a dear friend. Where might be the best place for me to go? Hmm. Well, you'd probably want to go up. Ah, that is very exciting because, again, the ceiling. Oh, Madonna. Very nice. Very tall. (laughs) How do I go up? He points at a lift that shoots up into the tower. Ah, I just uh, go over there. That way. He points again. Up. I cannot thank you enough. It was great talking to you. The people here are so accommodating. (laughs) Ciao. And I'm going to make my way towards the lift. Okay, so you can see that you're currently in a line for a lift that goes down. A lot of people in workwear, dressed as miners and dressed as forge workers, heavy overalls and big gloves and things like that. The lifts that go up, people are dressed a little bit more finely. Not by any means rich clothing, but people with button-down shirts, rolled-up sleeves, rather than these work boots. These people have seen an Excel spreadsheet before. Uh, No. Oh, okay. Maybe some of them, but not necessarily, no. These are more like artisans. Got it. Why don't we do another investigation check here? Give me another shot of this. Okay, dirty 20. Yeah, on a dirty 20, you can see the quite a few lifts go up. You can see the area for lifts that go up, separate from the area for lifts that go down. There are local lifts and express lifts. There is also, on the wall, this big mosaic of constantly changing colors. And on a dirty 20, you can see that this is a map of the tower, and these pinpoints of light that appear and disappear show the location of at least a 100 different lifts as they dart around the tower. So you see a lift bound for Middle Sharn, and you see a lift bound for Upper Sharn. What would you like to do? Do I know anything about the distinctions between Upper and Middle Sharn? I probably wouldn't, right? I'm relatively new to this place. You can roll history if you want. Give it a shot. I happen to be proficient in history. It's a 23. (laughs) Yeah, 23. That's great. What does the map say? (laughs) You know that Sharn is a very vertical city. It's a very old city that has gotten much taller over time as more sections have been built higher and higher and higher. Right now you're in Lower Sharn, there's Middle Sharn, and the highest part is Upper Sharn. Looking at the map, Alfonso would say, Luciano, this may not be as easy as I thought. There's quite a bit of city here. The nomenclature, upper, middle, low. It makes sense. Luciano trembles slightly, as if in agreement. Intelligence-based character here. I guess I'll head to middle Sharn. Luciano, what do you think? Middle Sharn sounds about right for where we are. It may not be so easy to get into upper Sharn. Maybe I'm overthinking this. I'm going to head towards middle Sharn. 
Luciano sort of does half of a shrug. All right. So you're going to head towards middle shot. You wait in line for a while until it's your turn. You're standing before this lift. The brass gates clatter open, and an impossible number of people stream out of this lift. It's the size of a regular elevator car, but probably about 50 people come out. As the last people are coming out, you can see inside. It does appear bigger on the inside. Are you getting in? Yeah, seems interesting enough. Let's go in. Yeah, okay. As you and the people around you walk in, they immediately take seats on benches before you are able to, and many others stand around holding onto straps that hang from the ceiling. Can I reach them or no? You cannot. Oh, no. (laughs) (laughs) Okay. The brass gates clatter closed. Roll a deck save, please. <laughs> I was actually going to say, honestly, no. I think Alfonso's a people person. Alfonso's just going to try and grab someone's pant legs for stabilization. Okay, great. Roll a deck save with advantage. Okay, cool. The first roll was 21, but let's just end on a 16. So, yeah, we're good. Probably either way. The lift takes off with an incredible amount of force, and you steady yourself on your feet as you grab onto this person's pant leg. Oh, guy. Yeah. <laughs> this little um, guy is doing it. <laughs> For some reason, I'm having incredible flashes to Bible Goes West. Oh my god, yes. (laughs) Excellent. This human whose leg you've grabbed shakes their leg to get you to let go of it. As the lift reaches a speed, you can no longer really feel the movement of it. You feel steady, like you're able to stand easily. Okay. You can see through the gate that the lift is moving quite fast. It also occasionally changes direction and orientation. At one point, you're going upside down, you're going sideways and backwards. But somehow, your feet always stay on the floor. Gravity always pulls you towards the bottom of this lift. So the lift comes to a halt. Make another deck save. 22 total. As this lift stops, you pop up into the air a little bit and then pop back down. <laughs> I was kind of hoping I would fail. It would be adorable and sad to see him fucking biff on his face. <laughs> I was kind of hoping you failed too. It would be very funny. <laughs> this lift reaches its destination. The brass gates open once more. And you walk out onto what really looks a lot like a train station and you can see a little ways further that you are on a city street there are buildings rising up in all directions and you can see just a little sliver of sky up between the buildings people stream out of this lift and walk in every different direction all right i'd like to make perception i guess investigation check just to see what buildings are around and what kind of signage is out there sure Okay. Does it need to be perception or investigation? You're better at investigation, right? Oh, yeah. Let's make an investigation. I would appreciate that. Okay, it was a five on the dice for a ten total. Okay, you see all kinds of different artisan shops selling all different magical items, alchemy shops selling not only potions, but alchemy paraphernalia. A lot of different craftsmen working all about. I'm going to say on your 23 history check from earlier, you know that this is where a lot of the most talented artificers in Corvair ply their trade. Okay. I'm going to go up to the nearest artificer booth. If it's not bustling with activity, I'll just go up and try to make a conversation with an artificer. Sure. You walk up to a street merchant selling potions. This is a human just kind of similarly, you know, work clothing, but a little bit more of a middle-class type of work clothing. Hello, friend. Nice to make your acquaintance. I am Alfonso Carlucci Ropetella. What is your name? My name is Malmum. Malmum. Ah, buonissimo. Great name. I love it. You specialize in potions, eh? As I can see. Yeah. You gonna buy anything? I may have had a mind to, but I'm so curious in your trade. You see, I am more of an armor crafter. I have worked. Well, it's no matter. How do you do all of this? All of what? And the good that, how do you say, uh, the potions. I'm not going to sit here and explain to you how potion making works. Are you going to buy anything or not? (laughs) I would not mind to buy something, but again, I don't know much about your world. I would appreciate knowing something. What should I buy? Health potions are a pretty popular option. And those make you healthy? Sure. Okay, how much for one health potion? For you, hmm, 40 gold. (laughs) I do apologize, sir. I I only have 25 gold. I'll take it. You got yourself a deal. Uh, In my hometown, we did not charge so much for potions. I understand this big city. I may have to take my business elsewhere. Well, all right, your health. Uh, You make a good point. Let me think about this for a while. Say, in the meantime, do you know of any artificers in town that specialize in armor? I would love to pick their brain. I think that's an expression we say, right? Yeah, there's uh, probably about a thousand of them in this tower. Which one is the best one? Which one is the one you wish you were? <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. One more. A way I think you will appreciate. Which one makes the most money? <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's easy. 
That'd be Merrix. Merrix. He's in charge of this place. Strong name. Where do I find Merrix? He just points straight up, top of the tower. Ah, the top of the tower. Kind of whispering. And yeah, Luciano, it seems I was incorrect. What was that? Ah, nothing. Sometimes I talk to myself. Mm. So, I can just walk in? Walk in where? It's the upper part of the city. Is it guarded? Are we allowed up there? If you got business up there, sure. People go up there all the time. What a lovely place. I like Sharon. You people are friendly, welcoming. Someone behind you goes, <clears throat> See? Hello. My name is Alfonso Carlucci Ropetel. Yeah, I heard. You can buy anything or what are you doing here? What the heck is Clork doing here? <laughs> <laughs> it's Clorkish. They're all Clork. It's the only voice I can do. <laughs> I don't think I am going to buy anything just yet. I'm going to make my way for the upper city. Is it nice up there? What is your name? It's none of your business. Get out of my face. Okay. Buona sera and Alfonso will quickly shuffle his way out of there and back to the lifts to go to the upper city. What language is Alfonso speaking? This is all some bastardization of common and Elvish. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know how he got this way. Wouldn't it be a bastardization of Gnomish and Elvish? It's a bastardization of common Gnomish and Elvish. Okay. And you get bad Italian. <laughs> yeah, not great English. It's really too bad this isn't a visual medium because the entire time you speak, you move your fucking hands. Of course I do. What are you going to do? What are you going to do? Dad, what are you going to do? <laughs> what are you going to do about it? All right. Back to the lifts. Second time's a charm. All right. Nice. On that check from before, now you can see lifts that go down to lower Sharn and the cogs and lifts that go up to upper Sharn. We know what we're doing. Assuming you're going up. Yeah. We're going okay. up. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So again, you get into this lift. You walk inside along with a lot of other people who immediately. I'm gonna try to. No, I'm gonna no. (laughs) Could I roll something to try to get on these fucking benches? And I need to literally (laughs) jump. Literally jump. You can give me either athletics or acrobatics to push your way through (laughs) this crowd of people. Eighteen on acrobatics. Seventeen on athletics. Yeah, Luciano assists you as you throw yourself (laughs) arms first into this lift across a bench to secure yourself a seat perfect no deck saving throws this time as the lift jolts into motion you feel it really strongly but you're not thrown off your feet cool this time when you arrive at the station this is a much nicer looking station the stone walls have this inlaid brass filigree it's a more modern looking area of the city and there are these what you would know to be ever bright lanterns these lights that don't go out built into the design of the station as you leave the lift. Okay. I'm going to keep walking and roll investigation again to see what buildings or whatever else I can enter. Uh, it's a 19. Okay, on a 19, you find your way out of this little station and out into the cold, wintry air. You can very much see a lot of sky now, and you are on a city street. People are trudging on slushy footpaths. There are storefronts, and row houses, and it's a pretty nice neighborhood that you found yourself in buildings all around you gray wintry sky above you what was the name of the person again that i'm looking for you're looking for merrick's in charge of this place so is there a building that stands taller than most that might look like the place i should be going yeah you do see the aforementioned top of the tower you see this spire rising up beyond the rows of row houses and buildings in a direction of the city that looks like you're going uphill okay i'm gonna go there okay as you start to walk uphill Your view crests the top of the row houses, and you can see the entire city before you. You are on top of just an unimaginably tall tower, probably a mile in the air. And you can see these rolling hills of tower tops, and each tower is the size of a small village. On each one, there's houses and shops and temples, and they seem to be constructed on the towers and into them. Each tower is very different. Some are made of polished marble, and some are made from that same crude stone block that you saw down below that was clearly very old. Some of them have vast sections excavated with new construction built on top of this old construction, and this entire city is just this big heap of construction over a thousand years old. Towers sprout from other towers, from the foundations, and they form these branching, crazy-looking buildings. And below you, you see this network of innumerable bridges connecting all of them in between. With carriages and people walking, this city is buzzing, and you're taking it all in for the first time. You are very far from home. In the sky, there's these flying carriages, there's creatures zipping around, there's floating billboards. It's wild out here. There's just shit happening in every direction. Even above me. Yeah, exactly. Great. And there's a very few towers taller than the one that you're on right now. They stick up 
out of the city. Luciano, I feel very overwhelmed. Let us hope we pick the right place. Luciano's shivering. Yeah. As you approach this spire, which rises even higher out of this tower that you're standing on the top of at this point, this is the entrance way to the spire. There is a mechanical doorman who opens the door as you approach. Grazie mille. It doesn't respond. I'll keep walking. Walk inside. This is sort of like the lobby of a skyscraper. This room is a very tall ceiling. It's well lit by those same ever-bright lanterns built right into the design. There are a few doors to the outside on different sides of this structure. There's a long reception counter on one wall, opposite a massive piece of abstract art made from pieces of various metals. People move around with purpose. They're walking from doors to lifts within this spire now, but they're wearing more formal clothing, business clothing. I'm going to go up to the reception. Okay. Yeah, you walk up to this reception desk, and there is just one mechanical receptionist standing behind the desk, and they say, Welcome to Kenneth Tower. Please state the nature of your business. Hello. My name is Alfonso Carlucci Rocatella. As you start talking, a brass pen on the counter animates and starts to write everything you're saying. Uh, Yes, I'm looking for a Merix. Alfonso will say nothing else. Welcome to Kenneth Tower. Please state the nature of your business. Ah, yes. I know what you like. And Alfonso will take one gold piece out and try to hand it to the receptionist. (laughs) How can I help you, sir? Ah, This does not work either. Uh, uh, Is there a Merix here? I am looking to speak to him about, uh, how do you say, strange armor. There is no need to raise your voice, sir. Oh, 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 uh, oh wait, fuck. Hold on. Please calm down. Mm-hmm. Me apologies. I did not mean to raise my voice. I didn't think I was, but... Please take a step back. Oh, oh okay. That is not a problem. I'll step back. Security, security, security. <laughs> what the fuck? <laughs> oh, oh uh, Luciano, I think we may need to run. Should we run? What do we do? Luciano, please help me. Three guards enter from a hall off to the side and block the exits. Alfonso will take a second coin out of pocket and try to hand it to the reception. <laughs> they start moving towards you. Roll initiative. They have their sword arms pointed towards you. Great initiative! 16. Okay, one of them's gonna go before you. So this first one approaches you. Drop your weapon. But I am not holding the weapon. It is at my side and then at my back. Pointing to his light hammer and quarterstaff, respectively. As you raise your hand to point, this warforged calls out. He has a weapon. And it swings an attack at you. This is not a weapon! This is... Okay. Oh, no. Here we go. Does a 14 hit? No. Okay. First one misses. It's your turn. Alfonso hops out of the way. I really do not want to hurt any of you. In fact, I just want help. Ah, no chance you want to stop, eh? Roll persuasion. It's a seven. That's not going to do it. Okay. Alfonso will clench his mechanical fist with Luciano and bring himself down to the ground. Here we go. And I'm going to activate my arcane armor and go infiltrator mode on this motherfucker. <laughs> As I do this, the glowing that Luciano represents in my arm turns a little bit bluer and crackles with lightning energy, and I'm going to attack with my lightning launcher. All right. Does a 15 hit. 15 hits. All right. You get the sense these guys are not very well constructed. Shitty prototype war They ain't the real deal. Okay. It's a total of 15 damage. As you shock this thing, it trembles and malfunctions and goes, Hey, hey, eat that weapon. And I'm going to attack it again. That is a 13 to hit. That just hits. Oh, cool. An additional nine. That kills it. How did you kill this thing? I reel back my lightning launcher fist, and instead of a propulsion of my arm out or a solid punch, what I will actually do is extend my arm out, palm open, and clasp my fist around this thing's head and just shock (laughs) it to death until it just (laughs) smokes and collapses in a pile of rubble. Wow, Iron Man. Jesus Christ. (laughs) Know me, Stark. (laughs) Oh my God. That's so good. I really did not want it to have to come to this. I did not want this to happen. Uh, I'm sorry. One of them, a different one than the one that attacked you before, approaches you and swings... Oh, it crits on you. <laughs> the first time I've crit since I was Gron. <laughs> right. That's not oh true. my god. That's not true. That's no, so mean. <laughs> you you fucking exploded that devil's eardrums. Yeah, I remember. Uh, no, you did yeah, a yeah, crit. Yeah, yeah. No, you did a crit and came too. That's true. A right. uh, crit. <laughs> Oh my god. Well, there we go. <laughs> That's what I get for that. Jimmy's back. <laughs> this is gonna be six slashing damage. <laughs> oh my god, a crit. <laughs> Yeah. <laughs> that's that's awesome. the one of the two. <laughs> <laughs> All right, cool. All right, that's his turn. There's another one. That one rolls a 19. Oh, and this one does nine slashing damage. 
I do not like how close you are getting to me. Ah, and I will slap both my hands down on the ground and cast Thunder Wave. If they can both make my con save, that would be tremendous. Sure. Okay. That's 11 and dirty 20. Okay, yeah, one fails, one passes. Okay. One takes 12 damage, and the one takes six. The one that takes 12 gets pushed back 10 feet. Because I attacked it, I can't make an attack of opportunity. Is that correct? Sure you can. If you don't have another reaction you want to use this round, let's go for it. Yeah. Yeah, I'll attack it. 19 on the dice. That's going to do it. 16 lightning damage. This thing's done. As it's being pushed away, what I will do is instead of grasping or clasping at it, I will just rear back my arm and just... Boom! And launch the arm at it, and it's going to just smash right into its chest, and then come back and reattach to my armor. Awesome. Yeah, as you blast this thing away from you, you punch it in the chest with your flying arm, and it's pushed away and lands in a pile of steaming parts on the floor. Hell yeah. And there's one left, and it's going to swing its arm blade at you. I can still give you a gold. I just want to talk to medics. 18 to hit. Hits. Four slashing damage. <laughs> Okay. What you are doing is not really hurting me. I do not think it's worth your while. Are you sure you want to continue? That's its turn. What are you going to do? Well, this thing just isn't talking to me. I'm going to just standard lightning launcher this thing. First attack is not going to hit. Second one probably is at a 19. 11 lightning damage. It's looking pretty busted, but it's still up. It's going to swing out at you. 19 to hit. Yeah. And that is 7 slashing damage. Your turn once more. End this, please. Yep. Gonna do the old wampum stompum. <laughs> Not the wampum stompum. <laughs> <laughs> the 23 to hit with a total of 13 lightning damage. Yeah, that'll do it. This time around, we're going for the old classic uppercut. And as my fist connects with its jaw, lightning will just crawl up its entire head and explode its head. Yeah, this thing is just a singed pile of parts now. Cool. I will land back on the ground, and I'll do that thing where you, like, dust off your chest, get rid of debris on your shoulder. (sighs) That was grim. I would rather not have done that, but... (sighs) The lift on the other side of the room dings at that moment, and someone emerges from the elevator. A human, probably in his late 50s, unshaven, wearing business attire, but with the sleeves rolled up, and he rushes over. What's going on down here? Oh, not again. Not again what? I was just trying to meet with a medics. And these, what I believe to be very kind receptionists, attacked me. I even gave them gold. (laughs) Yeah, that sounds about right. All right. I'm Merrix. Merrix. I'm going to go ahead and doff my armor. It is so nice to meet you. Come with me. Okay. He leads you over to the lift. And as the gates open on this lift, which looks the same as the other lifts on the outside, the inside is much nicer. The wall is made of polished red stone and bronze accents. And it's not quite as big as the ones downstairs. As you get into the lift, he yells back into the lobby, someone clean this up! And the gates close and the elevator, more gently this time, takes off and starts moving up. Uh, it's a work in progress. You know? Those things are no replacement for the real thing. Eh, I quite admire your city. Everything's very nice here. Very nice. My name, by the way, i sorry, I did not introduce myself, is Alfonso Carlucci Rocatella. It is a pleasure. Pleasure's mine. I'm Merrick Stikanov. Merrick Stikanov? Interessante. I only heard your first name. But a very nice one. Very nice one indeed. I hear you are an expert in armory. You could say that. Merrix, I was hoping you may shed some light on something for me. I am very grateful that you would even give me an audience. I'm from humble beginnings, you see. Mm -hmm. But I'm on a quest that is very important. I apologize, I have a hard time saying these words out loud, but my brother Luciano, he... Hold that thought. The elevator comes to a stop and the gates open and he gestures for you to walk out of the elevator, and then he leads you through a large open space where numerous lab experiments are taking place. There's small explosions, flashes of light, there's alchemy equipment, there's smoke of all different colors, and just a lot of people working on these different various magical experiments. And so he leads you through these winding halls, all these labs, things going on, to his office, ultimately. Not a very nice office. It looks like he really does a lot of work there. His desk is piled with different machinery parts, and there's all kinds of devices. You can only imagine what they might do all over the office. And a big window behind his desk shows a view of the entire city of Sharn. Have a seat. It is beautiful. What an amazing view. Yeah. Every day you get to look upon it. You must be so grateful. Yeah, it's fine. (laughs) All right. So what do I need to do to keep this quiet? This meaning, ah, ah, the receptionist. Ah, I see. Well, since you mention it. Gold? 
I like gold. Uh, information may be of more value to me. As I was saying, my dear brother Luciano, I lost him. In the war in Tervalistas, I lost my arm and my brother. And now, as you see, and I'll lift up my arm to show him the gem that's glowing, they are now one in the same. And I miss my brother very much. My arm not so much, but my brother very much. And now he's stuck here with me. I'm just Wait. boring him and annoying him all day, and I want to get him out. I want my brother back. Uh, hold on. Where's your brother? Alfonso will literally just point at the glowing node in his arm. This is Luciano. That arm. That's one of ours, isn't it? He rustles around in his desk a little bit and takes out a big magnifying glass. May I? Oh, please, please do, please do. I will extend my arm out to him. I was hoping you could tell me more about the arm itself. Perhaps a place I could go to learn more. I am desperate to bring my brother back. He flips your arm over and holds the magnifying glass to your wrist. Model APA-59... Number 38782, manufactured 961, Metro Sire. You say you're having some kind of issue with it? Still under warranty. You want a new one? No, quite the opposite. I want this one forever. I want my brother, but I do not want him in my arm. I want him back. His spirit lives with me. You see? Surely you see. Pointing at the node. That's impossible. He can't, he can't be in the arm. Here, look. Look right here. It's not on the spec sheet. It's not one of the features. You can't do that. But it must. My mentor from back home, Shailin, she did it herself. What is this gem you stuck in it? It's Luciano. That's what I've been saying. I've been telling you. This is Luciano. This is my brother. Mm. He's a very nice man. <laughs> I miss him very much. It's just, it's not part of the specification. You can't just put a person's soul into a machine. Trust me. <laughs> I love this. If it were possible, we'd be doing it already. That's what people said before there were cities and skyscrapers that went up near space. And then we found a way. Shailin, she found a way. And Luciano, allora. Luciano's here. All right. You know, that gem looks kind of like a kyber shard to me. Mm. Roll Arcana. 18. Yeah, on an 18, you probably could confirm this is a kyber shard, a type of dragon shard that's used for binding magic. You know, they harness elementals. They power the rail system. Was your brother an elemental? Eh. Uh... No, he was a gnome, just like me. A kyber shard, of course. How could I not see that before? Where might I find the source of these shards? Well, they got mines around where they dig them up. I don't know that much about binding, but I do know someone who does. Huh? <laughs> <laughs> I love that sound. Do that more. That's great. Uh? <laughs> <laughs> a friend of mine. He's a professor over at Morgrave University. Go and see him. His name is Professor Croswell. Professor Croswell. I will make my way to see El Professore. What is the fastest way there? Take a sky coach. On me. And he flips a gold coin at you. Grazie mille. I'm gonna make my way up. Godspeed. So you make your way back down to the lobby. The ruined constructs have been cleaned up. You walk out onto the street, and you see these flying carriages all around. People waving them down, and they zip off to all sides of the city. You're able to flag one down. It's Can I roll get on correct stagecoach check, please? Yeah, sure. Okay. It's a taxi. You tell it where to go. Yeah, it's a DC of one. Okay, cool. I got a 15 on the dice, and I assume I have proficiency in this, so let's add eight to that. 23. Perfect. Yeah, 23 will do it. You put your arm in the air, and a sky coach flies over and stops in front of you. These sky coaches are basically horse-drawn carriages without the horses. They fly through the air, and the driver is a goblin. Where are you going, Mac? Yeah, Morgrave University. The yeah. moment the word Morgrave was out of your mouth, the sky coach <laughs> took off. Book, and, books yeah. it. It's a pretty short ride. It just jumps this chasm from this tower to one that's not as tall, but is close to as tall, just right across. And pulls up, lets you out. Morgrave University. Grazie mille. My name, by the way, is Alfonso Carlucci Roccatella. It is nice to meet you. Here you go. And I'll hand him the gold coin. Thanks, Mac. And he flies away. All right. I'm going to go make my way into the university and find El Professore. Okay. It's a college campus. Ivy walls, white columns, campus green, cobblestone paths, big crest of the university. You wander around this campus for a while and you maybe ask for directions or read some signs or whatever, but you find your way into this lecture hall. See that there's a lecture going on today. Professor Croswell is lecturing. Because that's just the way things work sometimes. Hey, I mean, Perfect. I invented a spell to do this, so you're <laughs> yeah. doing great. <laughs> so you walk into the back of this lecture hall, and you see, talking to a group of students who look fairly checked out, like they've been sitting there for a while listening to this guy prattle on, a gnomish professor with white hair, large spectacles, and a wide mustache. He's wearing a brown tweed suit with a red bow tie. He seems to be wrapping up a lecture. His delivery is very dry. Many millennia ago, 
A civilization of giants rose from the continent of Zendrik. This interested the dragons, who were recognized as the wisest children of Eberron. They taught the giants their powerful ancient magic. The complexity of their artifice far surpasses even that of the present day. Many of the magical devices all around us have their roots in the ancient giant cultures of Zendrik. Everbright lanterns, elemental binding, key charms, to name a few. All lost for thousands of years, until being recovered and reintroduced by gnomish explorers and artificers who adapted it for the modern world. But that's all for today. The lecture wraps up. People start to move out of this room. Still some people sleeping at their desks. And he sees you up the stairs. And he greets you with a gnomish greeting. In gnomish, it literally translates to, what can you tell me? But then he switches to common. Ah, how can I help you? You are Professore Croswell. That's right. Piacere. My name is Alfonso Carlucci Rocatella. It is nice to meet you. I was sent here by Merix. You familiar? Ah, yes. Merix and I go way back. That is lovely. I have a bit of a personal dilemma, and Merix was kind enough to recommend you as someone that might be able to assist me. In so many words, I am looking for more information on binding. Hmm. I suppose, to give you the quick version... Alfonso literally just repeats the long version of the story that he gave... To <laughs> <laughs> hmm, that is very interesting. I do think that Merrick's was right to send you to me, but I don't know that much about the binding of humanoid souls. At that moment, another person enters the room. Ah, oh, there you are. He looks back to you, Alfonso. What was your name again? Ah, yes, it's Alfonso Carlucci Rocatella. This new person who's entered the room, human, he stands about six feet tall with striking blue eyes, razor-sharp jawline, and a dimpled chin. He has a neatly trimmed mustache accompanied by unimaginably prominent cheekbones, and he's wearing a fashionably cut suit. Ah, Professor, is this the new guy? N no, this is Alfonso. He it won't be easy out there. He looks you up and down. You do look capable, though. Capable of what, exactly? Alfonso, meet Mr. Gallant. Mr. Gallant will be leading our expedition to Zendrik. The two of them then proceed to explain to you that the university is mounting an expedition to the continent of Zendrik, where through translating a text they found on a recently found artifact, they believe that there is a site that bears some archaeological importance, that they could learn something about the ancient artifice of the giants. They ask you, would you like to come along? Professore, this place, Zendrik, would you imagine that there'd be a chance I'd learn more about, uh, you know? And then uh, Alfonso motions down to his arm. Well, Zendrik is a mysterious, wondrous place. I imagine you could learn any number of things there. You know, over the centuries, as they dug up the remains of these giant ruins, they never expected to find what they did find. Wondrous artifice. I suppose there's certainly a chance you could learn something relevant to your... Quest. So how about it? You in then? Well, I've met the best of the best in Sharm, and they suggest I come with you? I come with you. Count me in. I am ready. Excellent. We go now to pastoral grasslands on a clear, cloudless day. A convoy of ten carriages pulled by oxen travel on a dusty, remote road. They're transporting a large quantity of iron across the plains from the mountain mines of the dwarven homeland to the forges and factories of the nation of Sire. Among the security is Istvan. Scala, go ahead and describe your character. Istvan has a slightly strange look about them for a dwarf. Their compact frame is more lithe than stout. They wear a short, neatly trimmed beard. Their dress is nondescript, simple dark clothing under a heavy blacksmith's apron and worn leather boots. A brace of hammers is strapped to their waist on a belt, closed with a broad iron clasp. Their calloused hands hover restlessly by these tools of their trade, almost reluctant to touch the more ornate warrior's tool that hangs across their back. Their blue eyes scan the horizon warily beneath a neat bun of light brown hair, and as the sun beats down on them, they wipe their forearm across their face to clear the sweat and soot with a weary sigh from the march. <sighs> well, Hanatar, let's hope nothing goes wrong today. You've made this trip a few times in the past. Not that treacherous, really, down the mountains, across the plains, into Sire. You're always glad when you see the city on the horizon. It means your journey's coming to an end. Other than warding off some dangerous creatures, this trek has been largely peaceful. One of your companions points off the side of the convoy, where the gentle rolling hills meet the horizon. They hand you their spyglass. Look there. Sure, I'll take a look through it. Go ahead and roll perception, with advantage. You see something. Okay, a 
five and a four. Oh it's going to be <laughs> an eight total. If you see something, I surely don't. You can see what they pointed out. In the far distance, the outline of an enormous, long-necked dinosaur lumbering across the landscape. It's not the first time you've seen a dinosaur crossing these plains, but it's still an incredible sight to behold. Thank God there's dinosaurs in the first episode. Let's go. Uh, shame we can't domesticate those great reptiles to pull this stuff. We'd move a lot more <laughs> a lot quicker, don't you think? Fucking amazing. If you think you might know anything about dinosaurs, you can try to roll nature. I can try. Okay, no, no clue. This dinosaur has a long neck. It's little foot. <laughs> <laughs> Walks on four legs. With those clunkers, you keep walking for a little bit, and then you hear someone shout out, What's that? And they point back in the direction of the dinosaur as a big dark cloud of dust has appeared on the horizon and is making its way towards you. Would I know what this phenomenon is? You can roll history. Okay. 21. Yeah, for a 21 history, you do know this is disputed territory, and so this might be the reason that this convoy is so heavily guarded. This is a horde making its way towards you. You can't tell of what yet, but something's kicking up a lot of dust, and the dust looks darker than the dust that's being kicked up by your oxens and carts. Get under the wagons! Get to safety if you can! The Iron Gate will handle this! And they pull a pair of their hammers off of their side. Awesome. That was a really good history check. On that check, you know that specifically these plains are mostly uninhabited, but the nation of Karnath has laid claim to these roads. Mm -hmm. And these are vital supply lines to the nation of Sire, who is at war with the nation of Karnath. And so they would have an interest in disrupting your operation here. As they get a little bit closer, you want to reroll a perception check with that spyglass with advantage? Sure. Nat 20, 23. On a nat 20, you can see this is absolutely a detachment of the Karnathi army. And with that spyglass on the 23, you can see these are undead forces, some on undead horseback, and they carry among them this aura of negative energy. Darkness accompanies them, and they blaze a trail of death behind them as the grasses die on this path that they've created. Blighted Karnacromancers. My older sibling told me the best way to deal with these. Hit them hard and break the bones. Have at ya, ya fiends. And I get ready to fight. Yeah, so now they're almost upon you. At this point, you can roll initiative. Okay. Twelve. Okay. At the front of this horde of enemies is a line of skeletons holding swords. These are some of the most basic foot soldiers of the Karnathi army. This is really not a big high-stakes operation. They've sent a bunch of skeletons to disrupt these supply lines. And so, as these skeletons arrive, one of your companions swings out at a skeleton, and it's absolutely going to hit. This sword swings through them doing 12 damage on this first skeleton. It completely crumbles and collapses, and this swinging blow also hits the next enemy in line as well. All right. So these cleaving through enemies rules are live. (laughs) Nice. There are seven of you, and now there are nine skeletons remaining. And all of them go on the same initiative order. Let me roll. That one's going to hit. Does six damage this one who led the charge of your people. Okay. The skeletons are swinging out. They've done some damage on this guy, but he's still up. He's not looking too bad, but he's taking some hits. Okay. All right, and now that is you. All right, I'm going to rush to this person's aid who's being swarmed by skeletons. Okay. These will be made with advantage since that person is engaged with basically all the skeletons right now. Okay, cool. Yeah, so I'll actually slide the two hammers I drew back into my belt and pull the warhammer off my back as I run over to this mob. And just for a little monk flavor, I'd like to do a little pole vault with the hammer, fly through the air, and then use the momentum to land the first swing. Holy shit, Very cool. Very, very cool. There they are. The first one's going to be a 19 to hit. 19's definitely going to hit as many of the skeletons as you want. (laughs) Not relevant which one, but one of them takes 10 points of bludgeoning damage. That does it. This thing is just a pile of bones now. Okay, if there's any left over, I'll... There is not. Okay, then I'm just gonna pivot to the next one and swing at them. Nat 20. Uh Uh-huh. Hell yeah, let's go. Nice, Okay. Make it count. So that's gonna be a total of... 
20 points of damage to however many skeletons I can smash. Yeah, that's exactly two more skeletons. Okay. And then I'm going to spend a key point. Okay. And as Istvan does this, you see this molten orange glow emanate from their body like iron just pulled out of a furnace. And they throw a pair of kicks at the ribs of the skeleton nearest them. Jeez, that's another nat 20. (laughs) Excellent. What the fuck? This is never going to happen again. Makes up for those horrible utility rolls before. Okay, so first unarmed strike is going to be 12 points of bludgeoning damage. Takes one out with two left over. Okay, that's going on to this next one. Who's going to take this other unarmed strike? Okay, this is just highly improbable. Shut up. That's a third nat 20 in a row. Wow. Just getting them all out of the way up front here. Yeah, like I said, I'm now doomed. Istvan didn't want to make an entrance, that's all. I guess. We want to make an entrance. So that's going to be 7 plus 4, 11 more bludgeoning damage. All right, so that takes care of another one and even hits another one, which is still standing. Did you just kill four fucking enemies in a single turn and damage a fifth? I did. Hiya! Yeah, that is Munchy. what happened. Holy shit. There are four skeletons standing of the original ten. The inner flame of Onatar is strong. Be gone, you vile undead! Wow. I didn't even wow. need these other fucking guys. Yeah, right? And the rest of them rolled so badly they go after you. That hits. Hit. So three hits on these skeletons. Six. Yeah, they're able to finish off these skeletons in their turns. And now the next wave is arriving. All right. Yeah. Ten more skeletons on ten warhorse skeletons. <laughs> Fantastic. It is the top of the order. It is other Iron Gate guard number one. The one who handed you the spyglass. Put the skeletons on those skeletons because we've heard he likes skeletons. Who doesn't like skeletons? So these ten approach and your companion swings out, hitting the first one in the line for six slashing damage. Skeletons. Here they come. They are still attacking that one that looks wounded. It looks like they are actively trying to kill Mm. this person. Notably, they are not going for any civilians with your convoy. They're only attacking the security forces. They're not even trying to make their way through you to the convoy. They don't seem interested in the convoy itself. They're trying Mm. to get you. That's strange. Okay. Hit. Hit. Classic Jimmy Dice. That's two hits out of the ten. Oh my god. Jesus. Yeah, I know. I know. So, two of them hit, and they are hitting the same one. Ooh, your companion here is looking incredibly hurt. Like, really, really hurt. And that's your turn. Does my companion have a name? I didn't plan for one. Uh... Ulrich! Get back to the caravan! I'll protect you! And I run again at this mob of skeletons and try to get a few of them down so I can clear a path for this ally of mine to escape. Does an 18 hit? 18 hits. Okay. So that's going to be nine bludgeoning damage. Okay. And then my extra attack is going to be a 20 to hit for 12 bludgeoning damage. Yeah. The first hit reduced one almost completely to zero, but not quite. Second mm-hmm. one would put it over the edge. Do you want to carry over that damage to the next skeleton in line, or that first one's mount? I think I'm going to go to the next skeleton in line. Okay, so you take out two of these skeletons, just knock them right off their mounts in a flurry of hammer and bone, and two mounts are now just going crazy. All right. And then as a bonus action, I'm going to give one of these horses a kick, because I can. (laughs) Sometimes you just got to kick a horse. 21 to hit. Yeah. For a maximum of 10 bludgeoning damage on this horse. Yeah, that hurts that horse pretty badly, but it's still up. Knock a giant rib out of it, goes flying. Okay, that's my turn. Okay. Ulrich is going to try to get away. Okay. But that would be an attack of opportunity. Yeah, that's a hit on Ulrich, and Ulrich is struck down. Ulrich, no! (laughs) You damn fool! Of all the character deaths, Ulrich hurts the most. (laughs) You just named him. (laughs) (laughs) Really tough pill to swallow, Ulrich dying so early in the campaign. Now the guards are going to take their turns. 
four hits against these skeletons. Take out that first horse, and then we take out the second horse. There are eight remaining, and we're at the top of the order. One more hit right here. All right, there is one very injured, well, he's dead, so one very damaged looking skeleton (laughs) atop one of these horses. Eight of them remain. Miss, miss, hit. All right, three hits in there. On the skeleton's turns, they also significantly wound another one of your companions. Mm. Okay. Who is named? Other, like, like Nordic. See, you start naming them, and then that's a real problem. Broderick. Roger. No. <laughs> I did not say Roger. <laughs> oh, okay. Broderick. Roderick, okay. No, Broderick. Broderick, okay. Yes. <laughs> Important. Now I know who I will cry out to in distress. All right, I'm going to keep attacking these skeletons. All right. Does a 15 hit? Yeah, it hits either the skeletons or the mounts. Yeah, I'm going for the skeletons at this point. Eight bludgeoning damage to one. Another attack will hit with an 18. Mm -hmm. And that's going to be 14 to that one. So I think that's enough to finish this one, finish another one, and dink a third one for a little bit. Yep, you dinked one. Absolutely. All right, so I'm going to monk shit my way on top of the horse of the one I knocked off. And from that position, I'm going to spend a key point and throw another two kicks at this skeleton that I've damaged. 21 to hit. Uh Uh-huh. For 10 points of bludgeoning damage. And I think that's going to be a miss. 10 is the second one. Yeah, that's a miss. Okay. Oh, man. I think the 10 is still enough to finish this one, though. Yeah, definitely. And hurt another one. I kick its skull clean off its vertebral column. (laughs) Very good. Four remaining, one of them's hurt. And so your companions are going to get three hits against them. Pretty good. Knocking one, knocking a second one, and hurting a third. And these horses are just running wild now. And the rest of this detachment, a few dozen more skeletons are right behind them. As they're moving in, the air is getting thicker and darker, and the sky is turning dark gray, and you can see just inky blackness behind these skeletons. Ulrich is down, so... If these horses are running wild, should I roll something to stay on top of the one I'm on? Oh, you're still on top of one. I thought you were doing, like, a monk ship maneuver. No, yeah, you should absolutely... Are you... Have you mounted this horse, or are you just standing on top of it? I'm just standing on top of it. That's a 25 acrobatics, though, so... Uh, Yeah, you're you're surfing this horse. You're fine. You're surfing. (laughs) (laughs) You know, there's dinosaurs and horse surfing. The classic dwarven art of horse surfing. (laughs) Love it. Yes. What is this scene? (laughs) Yeah, I know. Okay, now you see Ulrich's body start to tremble, and from it emerges a spectral form. There is now this ghostly figure that vaguely looks like Ulrich, sort of. His facial features can't really be made out, but there's a ghost now here. Okay. More specifically, a specter. Okay. One miss and one hit. Okay. Broderick's looking rough. He's still swinging, though. Hey, Broderick! Not you, too! (laughs) (laughs) Oh, my God. Now it's your turn. Okay, cool. So how far away is this specter from me? He's where Ulrich was. Pretty close. Close. All right. It's a big mob of bones and skeletons and horses and dwarves. Now a specter's here. Down from this horse that I'm surfing upon... What a fucking statement. I now yank some hammers off my belt. I focus this molten energy of my inner flame into the ends of these hammers as a bonus action, activating my Kensei's shot, and I hurl two of them at the specter of Ulrich. What is a 22 hit? That'll hit. Okay. Are those magical attacks? No. Okay. That's going to be nine bludgeoning damage. Okay, that's half to four. And then the second one does a 14 hit. 14 does hit. Okay, and that's going to be another uh, minimum of six bludgeoning damage. That's all I'm going to do. I continue attempting to horse surf. <laughs> yeah, please roll me a horse surfing check. Yeah, that's another 25. Yeah, that'll... You can, you're doing tricks on the horse. Do you have proficiency in horse surfing? You know, 
Come to think of it, they could have been animal handling, but I guess it's not an animal, it's an undead. Alright. It's also not riding it, <laughs> literally. <laughs> Fucking surfing. Standing on it. <laughs> Couldn't be more acrobatic. <laughs> Jesus. Yeah. Okay. These iron gate guards are up. Four good hits. One out. They finish off those guys. That's a good hit, but stop fighting, Broderick, and run! Can't you see they're trying to add our souls to their army of the dead? <laughs> now, none of your allies fell this turn, so something different is going to happen. I don't like the sound of that. This dark cloud is now completely upon you. The sky is blacked out and the sun is just like a small orange circle in the sky, dim, and it's almost completely dark all around you. And you see emerge from the crowd of skeletons and chaos a much scarier looking undead creature. A wraith is making its way towards you. This is a ghostly skeletal form. It's not touching the ground, but it doesn't seem fully physical or fully ghostly. And it's going to attack you because you're making the most noise here. Okay. (laughs) It's only a nine to hit. That'll miss. Yeah, it will. All right. Oof. Show this wraith what for. Your turn. All right, then. I will show this wraith what for. If it's right up in my face, I'm going to pull the Warhammer back off my back and going to try and crack it a good couple of times. Nat 20. Okay. Jesus. For Scal is trying to beat the record for when fucking Alwyn rolled oh, yeah, seven in one game. Oh yeah, for when Alwyn rolled all those nat twenties. Just out of the gate swinging. Twenty three bludgeoning damage. Okay. And then the second attack. Does a seventeen hit? Seventeen does hit. Yeah. Okay, and that's going to be another five bludgeoning damage minimum and then as a bonus action i'm gonna headbutt it okay <laughs> 20 to hit <laughs> so fucking casual with that statement <laughs> 20 to hit it hits i probably feel like a gross feeling as my head dips a little into this spectral body yeah that's <sighs> disgusting yes i maybe regret my impulsive decision later but i do deal 10 points of bludgeoning damage to it yeah good you do have all of that happened. Of course. Ghosts. Buddies are up. Broderick is going to try to get away in fear. Wraith is going to make an opportunity attack. Wraith is going to hit Broderick. Jesus. Fucking you fools, me. didn't they teach you how to disengage? <laughs> oh, yeah, of course. Yeah, should have done that. <laughs> should have done that. You're right. Here should've comes done another that. specter. Yeah, so Broderick is, as he's trying to get away, struck down by this ghostly form. He stops in his tracks and falls down dead. And three more of them. Miss. Miss. Okay, one hits. Not very much. Alright, back to you. Okay, I'm going to spend a key point to disengage, hopping from the back of this horse, very nimbly, and I'm going to back away 20 feet, take my other two hammers off my belt, and hurl them at this wraith. Does a 13 hit? Just barely. Wow, Wraith has a low AC. Okay. It's going to take eight more bludgeoning damage. Mm -hmm. And then an 18 to hit Mm -hmm. for another eight bludgeoning damage. And then I'm going to take the remaining 15 feet of my movement to keep backing away from the Wraith and wave at my comrades to do the same. Your comrades disengage this time and they make their way towards you. The wraith raises Broderick's body as a specter. So now this wraith has two specters, one on either side of it. Mm -hmm. That was the wraith's action. The specters are coming after you, and they're very fast flying. They're going to fly directly towards you, and here we go. That's a 19 to hit. That'll hit. 11 necrotic damage. Yikes. And con save, please. Does a 12 pass? A 12 does pass, yes. Oof, okay. The other specter now, 23 to hit you. That'll hit. For another 10 necrotic damage, and another con save, please. Passes, that's a 23. Yeah, oh yeah, nothing happens. So now both specters have taken their turn. One has been hit, the other is untouched. All right, I'm going to see if I can't finish this last specter off with a couple Warhammer swings. 17 hits. 17 hits. Okay. That's going to be 9 bludgeoning damage. And that's higher. 22 to hit. For... 
Only five bludgeoning damage. Okay, yeah, this thing's still up. Still up. Alright, I'm gonna spend a key point to flurry of blows again. I'm gonna throw some flying elbows at it. That's gonna be a 17 to hit. Mm -hmm. For nine more bludgeoning damage. Okay. And... Uh, only an 11 to hit on the last one. That last one does not hit. Just barely misses. And it's still up? It's a little bit up. Just a little. Yeah, that's what happens sometimes. Your comrades look to you. Do we stand and fight? Nay, get back! I'll buy you a little time if I can! Don't let yourselves become more of them! Gesturing to the specters before us. They are off running, just completely away. The civilians of the wagons have long abandoned. They are running across the plains. The animals are panicked. So everyone's retreating, and that is the Wraith's turn. Wraith is going to come towards you, and it's going to lash out at you. Only a 13 to hit. That'll miss. All right, specters. Okay. <laughs> okay. It's a dirty 20. That'll hit. Mm-hmm. Oh, God. 16 necrotic damage on you with a con save, please. 16. That passes, and the second one's going to attack you. Crit fail. Okay. What do you do? I'm going to swing my hammer one last time at the Spectre of Ulrich. Try and put their soul to rest. 21 to hit for 7 bludgeoning damage. (laughs) Oh, no. Doesn't quite do it. Doesn't quite do it. Okay. Natural 20. Yeah, and with the cleaving mechanics, I'll say you can hit the last hit point and move it over to the other one. Yeah, all right. I'm going to (laughs) move... 17, so I'll move the other 15 damage over to the Wraith that I've also hit some. And then I'm going to spend my last key point to (laughs) disengage as a bonus action and book it 35 feet in the direction where all of my companions are fleeing. You swung through and one of these specters poofed away. Everyone's running back to the Wraith. These things are fast and they're going after your companions. You feel your inner flame dimming as these wraiths are hot on your tail and as well your companions. And they are in hot pursuit and this dark cloud is getting even darker and suddenly you awake in a cold sweat. Blast. It's just a dream. We must be passing too close to whatever that damn moon is that gives you the bad dreams. (laughs) I don't know any of that. No astronomer, me. A radio plays nearby. Thousands were evacuated from the city of Metro last night as undead Karnathi forces overwhelmed Siren defenses. This is Karnath's fourth surprise attack on the nation of Sire this year and is, without doubt, its most devastating thus far. Stay tuned for continuing coverage of this developing situation. You realize that in your sleep, you were clutching the spyglass given to you by Ulrich. You're in a small tent on a modest bedroll. I look at the spyglass. I hope your soul has found some peace, my friend. And I collapse it back and put it into my pocket. Where am I? As I step out of my tent. When you open your tent flap, a wave of warm, humid air washes over you. It is already oppressively hot as the early morning sun peers through the canopy of leaves above. It's still winter back home, but Zendrick is equatorial. Hot, humid, and tropical. Above, red, pink, orange, golden, and purple clouds stretch across the sky as the sun rises, forming massive, complex weather systems. Animal sounds give an audible texture to the hazy morning air, tweeting, squawking, screeching, chirping, and howling. So, you see this campsite scene. Several tents all around, a fire that was put out within the past hour or so. You can see Professor Croswell and his two research assistants pouring over some heavy tomes. The leader of the expedition, Gallant, and his Mantis Folk guide, looking at a map, and Rizian, a Kunderak-affiliated dwarf, and his two associates are packing up their tents. What is Alfonso doing this morning? I'd imagine Alfonso is packing up his tent from last night. He's probably struggling to do it. It's tough for a little gnome. He has a tent that is probably elf-sized because they didn't sell a lot of gnome-sized tents back in Terravalistas. So he's struggling. He's kind of getting it together. He looks a little different now on the expedition. He has a cape that he carries with him going off to the side. It covers his one mechanical arm a little bit. Other than that, he keeps scale armor on. And that's basically it. I believe the scale armor is purple and gold, but it doesn't have a regal or well-kempt look about it. It's dusty, it's scraggly, but it definitely gets the job done. And that's what he's looking like, and that's what he's up to. Nice. Istvan walks over to the fire 
and begins feeding it, starts it up again. If there is a solid piece of metal that they've been using for an anvil, they'll begin wiping that down and getting that ready. The most significant change in their appearance as they look into this flat piece of metal is they've taken great care on this expedition, even this far out into the wilderness, to keep themselves clean-shaven. A beard is a mark of honor. Istvan believes they have none. And they begin working on whatever piece of equipment needs repairing or constructing for this expedition's purposes. One of the dwarven Kundarak associates takes notice of what you're doing over there. You know his name is Orlot. Oh, uh, with the hammering again. Yeah. I must pay my respect to Anatar. Not that you'd understand. What was that supposed to mean? Istvan grunts, <laughs> spits on the ground. <laughs> So Orlot is bald-headed, big beard, lightly armored, but definitely here in a martial capacity. Orlot has a big axe on his back. Okay. You're in the routine now. Anything else you want to do at camp before the expedition sets off as they do every day? Not I. Alfonso? Buongiorno. When do we make out? Wait, let me rephrase that. That doesn't sound good. (laughs) (laughs) Jeez, Jeffy, it's a little early Uh, for a ship, don't you think? uh, Gallant yeah. raises one eyebrow. Yeah. yeah. Get me drunk first. <laughs> yeah, so Alfonso will come up to the two Orlot. Orlot. Orlot and Istvan. Buongiorno. Do either of you know when we may make our way out into the jungle a little further? Beats me. When Gallant says we move, we move. I am very eager to move forward. It is lovely out here. There's so much to see, so much to do, so much to discover. Surely you feel the same. Eh, Istvan? Istvan sighs. <sighs> Aye, it's a wonderful place. When it's not unbearable heat, it's torrential rain. Terrific. I can't wait for more of it. Ding. (laughs) Ding. (laughs) Uh, I can certainly relate. Tervalistas did not have such a variable pattern of weather. It's nice to have variety. Ah, that's a word for it. So you're at this campsite after two boat rides, one that spanned the Thunder Sea and another navigating the winding inland rivers of the continent. You set off on foot... And that was five days ago, and you've just been trusting this guide out in the jungle ever since. You can tell that the people on this expedition are getting increasingly crotchety as the days wear on, the hot weather and the humidity and the bugs are really starting to get to you. Now listen here, you omniscient narrator. I'm not (laughs) crotchety. (laughs) Gallant looks up from his map and says, All right then, we ready to head out? I am more than ever ready. In fact, I am eager, Mr. Gallant. And Professor, he come with us, yeah? Yeah, of course. Professor Croswell and his research assistants pack up their books and with their translations and their tomes, and they make their way over. The dwarves finish packing up their tents. Ugh, great. I just got this metal hot enough to work with, and now we're off again. Ugh. Well, you should know better than that. We haven't stayed anywhere very long. I thought you wanted these grappling hooks made with some speed. Ah, right. Grappling hooks. Ugh, it's all right. Suppose I can try and finish them tonight when we make camp. And I pack up my stuff and get ready to move. The mantis folk clacks his mandibles, twitches his antenna, and looks at Gallant. Gallant looks back at him. All right, Clacky, which way are we going? And Clacky sets off in a direction, into the jungle. Can't wait to try and do that name, Clacky, in an Italian accent. <laughs> Hope they don't stick around for too long, because that's going to be <laughs> difficult. <laughs> a Clacky. Ah, oh, no, we got it. We're good. We got there. Don't you guys know the guides are always the first ones to get eaten by the dinosaurs? Perfect. <laughs> I don't know. I think this guy with the stereotypically heroic name is not long for this world. Who, oh, Chad Gallant? <laughs> Chad oh, my Gallant. God. <laughs> <laughs> yep. I think he's going to get murked in the first five minutes. <laughs> now I feel like it needs to happen. All right. Anyway. <laughs> so you set off into the jungle. There's really no trail here. You're just blazing right through trees, you know, pushing vines out of the way, stepping over things. And in the five days that you've been traveling through this jungle, Clacky has reliably led you safely. You haven't run into anything too incredibly dangerous. You know, conditions are not favorable, but you hear Zendrick back home. That name is associated with huge monsters and wild curses, and you haven't seen much of that at all yet. So, after walking for a while, Professor Croswell pipes up. We should be approaching the site soon. Anything you want to do here on the trail? Professor, is there something we should be looking for in particular? We're looking for a ruined giant city, previously uncharted. 
We only recently learned of its whereabouts. So look for giant structures, that sort of thing. Sounds like it will not be too difficult at all. And then Alfonso will put his hand above his eyes and start scanning. Yeah, give me a perception check. While this is going on, I will also try and keep an eye out for what's going on. Although not in such a cartoonish, exaggerated way. (laughs) More of an Eeyore Oscar the Grouch kind of cartoonish way. Got it. Only a 10 on that perception. Okay. And my perception, 8. All right, so on a 10 and an 8, you definitely don't see any of what Professor Croswell was asking you to look out for. But you do notice that the area that you're walking through does seem to have been crossed before. Someone has been here. So you keep walking for a while, and let's have one more round of perception checks after walking for a couple hours. Okay. That's much better. That's a 20. (laughs) That one, two. Jesus. All right. On a 20, you notice that there are footprints here. And on a 20, you can tell it's quite a few sets of footprints. Like a group had walked through here. Humanoid in nature? Absolutely. Yes. Boot prints. I suppose I should bring this to the attention of the expedition leader. Ah, Chad! Yeah? Tell me I'm not the only one seeing this. All these tracks. Ah, looky there. Looky there indeed. Someone else has been here. Thought this place wasn't populated. Nothing but monsters and other sorts of curses. Everyone is looking at these tracks now. And then Rizian, the dwarf leader of these Kundarak associates, brings up the fact that, well, I think that these are our footprints. Ah, so we're going in circles is what you're saying. Going in circles? These mantis folk are supposed to know where they're going out here. Damn clacky. Good for nothing. So as Gallant is admonishing clacky for getting you lost... One of Professor Croswell's research assistants notices something through the trees. Everyone roll nature. No, just a seven here. Ventiquattro. Twenty-four. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Jimmy's like, I don't want to be dealing with fucking Italian numbers for the rest of the campaign. <laughs> Istvan, on that roll, you see a giant rock. But Alfonso... You notice, around the edges of this rock, this is not just a rock, this is a piece of masonry. Probably the cornerstone of some kind of enormous structure. Signore Chad, I believe I have found something Uh. of interest. (laughs) He stops yelling at Clacky for a moment. Yeah, what is it? I think our friend uh, Clacky has actually done a marvelous job. This looks to be some sort of structure. Perhaps we are at the beginnings of a city? An outpost? In Terra of course, we had outposts. They were very helpful. I would imagine they would have the same thing in these cities here. Are you familiar with outposts? About halfway through what you're saying, he just walks towards the rocks. Well, looky there. So as you make your way through these trees towards whatever this big rock is, you see a lot more of these as well. And comparing them, they appear to be pieces of ruined buildings, maybe castles or fortresses. You see wrecked columns and collapsed archways and these enormous stone blocks. A lot of them are still building-shaped the more you walk into this area. Some of them are 40 or 50 feet tall that you can clearly see once you get through these trees. So Rizian says, I do believe this is our destination. And he starts handing out bags of holding to each person in the expedition. So each of you get a bag of holding. Very cool. That excites me as someone that definitely knows what a bag of holding is. Oh, come on, Jeppy. For the listeners at home, what's a bag of holding? (laughs) God damn it. (laughs) A bag of holding is an item that appears like a sack, not unlike a potato sack, but a little bit nicer construction. But inside you can hold an enormous amount of things and it never weighs more than 15 pounds. I mean, I know. That's cool. Right. I knew you knew that. I just thought I'd say that for the listener, you know. So Rizzy hands each of you a bag of holding. Bring back anything you find to me. I'll ensure you're paid fairly. And he and his associates head off in one direction. They find their way. They pry open this stone thing and they begin rooting around for valuables professor croswell and his research assistants immediately begin taking notes making drawings and just perusing the area you having trouble with your arm alfonso i can bang it back into shape if you like oh no thank you however i did notice you do have talent with a hammer i too am an armorer from terra a lovely city anyway you probably are able to identify valuable minerals I have the same skills, I believe. Perhaps you and me, uh, what you say? And we'll gesture to the bag of holding and suggest that we fill up our bags together. All right, we won. Let's go. So you walk out into this 
ruined giant city. You see huge stone blocks, some partially buried, caked with earth, some covered in moss. This place has been very much reclaimed by nature since whatever happened to it happened. You said you are an armorer. I wonder, do the armorers in Tervalistas also pay homage to Onatar? Well, if they do, I am unaware. You see, I was not so involved in paying homage or anything of this sort. I worked for the Lyran Hand, which simply provided aid to the elves. You see, this was my purpose. A very noble one, in fact. The elves are great people. They took me in. Tervalistas is a wonderful city. Have I not mentioned this? Only every opportunity you get. I ask, because to me, smithing is no simple craft. It's part of a spiritual discipline. I was a disciple in the way of the Sacred Hammer, a monastic teaching of Onatar that combines the artistry of the Hammer with its martial practice. And I was wondering if perhaps you had some similar spiritual connection to your work. Well, there is something spiritual to it. Looking down at the glow coming from his arm. But that's for another time. All right, let's see if we can't find something that's worth bagging up out here. Andiamo! (laughs) Every time. It's good every time. As you begin exploring. So, the Green Warden. When last we left you, you were also among ruins, unable to leave due to some sort of strange effect among the jungle. On this day, you are looking into this golden dragon shard, trying to figure out its mysteries, as you often do. Make some kind of roll. Something you feel like you'd be successful with. Make the grumble roll. Nat 20. (laughs) Get used to it, bitches. There's going to be a lot of that. I will roll insight. Okay. And that is a 14. Okay. On a 14, you can look into this golden dragon shard, and you see these draconic symbols within it, emblazoned almost under the surface of this crystal. They seem to make out some sort of message, but you're not really as familiar with the draconic language as, for instance, a dragon would be. But you can read a lot of the words. And so on a 14, you can make out some words here. You see green, protection, people, nature, gods, earth, fire. There's just so many words on this thing. Every different way you turn it, you see different ones. But no matter what angle you hold it at, you can't seem to make them make sense together or in context. So many. I do not yet understand you. I just look up from this stone and out into the sky above as I ponder all of these words that I can't quite put together yet. Looking at the sky, you can see the ring, you know to be called the Ring of Sybaris, still somewhat visible during the day, but the little points of light are not quite as noticeable as they are at night. But you can still see some of these constellations out there. As you're looking up, with your passive perception, you see movement above a nearby stone structure. Would be themes. Let's have a look. I get up and start moving towards it. All right. Roll perception proper as you move towards this. Sure. That is a 21. Yeah. On a 21, you see them first. A pair of people considerably shorter than you, one shorter than the other, making their way towards you. What manner of strange small folk say to myself as I am still in the distance. I think without getting too close to them, I bellow out the way I did to the previous would-be intruders. Who goes there? Isvan and Alfonso, you hear this. Yes, my name is Alfonso Carlucci Rocatella. Who are you? After you hear this voice booming out across this ruin, you look up and see Andy, what do you look like now after approximately 40,000 years. Amazing. I thought it was a couple hundred, maybe. No way, man. We in ancient. It's prehistoric. Yeah. The two of you see an enormous being. The giant rocks and boulders that make up their frame have been beaten and worn over time. Their root and vine bindings pale and dull green. But the green light that shines from beneath their giant helm still burns brightly. You see a tremendous great sword at his back, and what once may have been a beautiful cloak, now just a tattered, 
moss-covered shawl around his shoulders, which hangs halfway down one side, covering most of, but not all, of the many worn and weathered runes that are etched across his entire stone frame. And in this setting, it's not hard to see why you saw them before they saw you. You blend in with this ruin that's been reclaimed by nature, as if you're almost a part of it. Yeah, I mean, half of these stones that they've been walking through are the corpses of my dead brethren. (laughs) (laughs) That's true, too. How do you guys react? Well, you're talking. Are you a friendly rock monster? I am no monster, and you are a strange pair to this land. Who are you? I do not know if you do not hear me, but I said, my name is Alfonso I Carlucci. heard your name, strange, tiny folk. Ah, so why did you not respond? I asked you your name. Do you not have one? Forgive me. Perhaps in Zendrek there are different customs. I just continue staring at this other figure as Alfonso prattles (laughs) on. (laughs) Just a wanderer. Wanderer and Alfonso. I did not know your name was Wanderer. (laughs) (laughs) You're already so (laughs) annoying. Holy shit. I am a green warden. Of this place, perhaps the last of my kind, but the sentiment remains, what are you doing here? Excuse me, I am a little confused. You are a green warden. I've never heard of such a thing. But what is your name? I slowly step towards them through this jungle scene. I have no name. None the elves gave us, or our brothers each other. I am simply a warden. Elves, you say? Alfonso, go ahead and roll history as you're trying to figure out what this thing is. It's going to be good. 25. Okay, yeah, on a 25 history, you have a little bit of background knowledge on artifice in general, but you've also been paying pretty close attention to Professor Croswell as he prattles on about history and Zendrick and artifice and giants and so you know that the giants had arcana that was far more advanced than anything known today and among that was some constructs beings that would either fight for giants or do other menial labor often constructed of rocks and different types of mechanical parts Mm. and this kind of seems like it might be that sort of thing okay And you know that the elves were enslaved by the giants for their talent with magics. And so a lot of the famed giant artifice of history was actually performed by the elves. Ah, the elves, you say. This jogs the memory. We are working with a very esteemed professore. And I think I know where you come from. You, getting up there in age, eh? Mm. Istvan, I think we may have found a friend. Mr. Warden. We are here on an expedition. Listen to me, Alfonso. Yes? Do you think we should be bringing something that's so valuable back to Corvair? Precisely. That's what we're doing here, right? We didn't come here to find common goods. Corvair. I know not of this place. How long have I been here? There's a war on, and this construct could be a weapon. Do you really think that's a good idea? Mr. Ward. I turn back down towards Alfonso. <laughs> Andy, the player, highly curious what's coming next. I can hear it in your Extremely. <laughs> what would you like to do? You seem not like any giant or monstrous folk I have ever seen. Your intent, honest, but... For reason I do not know, I am bound to this place. I understand. I cannot help you with that. I do not think. However, my question. What do you want to do? Forget about me. Forget about my friend Wanderer. Forget about this place. What do you want to do? From beneath my mossy shawl, I 
pull out the Sybaris Dragon Shard and I hold it in my large stone hand, looking at it as I tower over these two individuals. I wish to know the meaning of this prophetic crystal. Aha! Turning to Istvan. Do you not see? Mr. Warden, he has his own hopes and dreams. Surely the elf who controlled him, however many thousands of years the ago. The Green Wardens were not controlled M- Mr. Warden, by Mr. the Mr. Warden, Mr. Uh, Warden, I see that. that created that is Thank by you. Okay. their wondrous power of druidic magic, yes, and serving side by side to free them from their bonds. Yes, but we were equals in our efforts. Ah, well, no matter. You prove my point anyway. <laughs> motherfucker! This being is completely of its own will. It will cause no harm if brought to Tervalistas, whatever place you want to be, it does not matter. How naive are you, we one? <laughs> if we take him back, he won't be of his own free will. Do you think House Kondrak will just... Let him go, and they could enslave him or dismantle him. Istvan, I'm aware that you have your reservations, but, yeah, well, I'd like to see them try. Istvan, now I see. Ugh, it's as Alfonso said. You have your own free will, you can do as you like. But if you come with us, don't let yourself be taken for a fool. I follow Onatar, but the other dwarves, they serve House Kundarak. They have no interest in creation, only the accumulation of wealth. Would I recognize the name Anatar as warden? Roll religion. With a plus four, that's going to be a 22. <laughs> yeah, on a 22, yeah, you know you know who Anatar is. You've heard this name before. Anatar is sort of like a deity, but more like almost an icon mm-hmm, mm-hmm. that you know from the... Icon with an E-I. No. It's just, I've been playing a lot of Final Fantasy, I'm sorry. Yeah, no. Jesus. Um, <laughs> from the legends passed down from the dragons through the elves to the green wardens, mm-hmm. you know mm-hmm. that certain dragons throughout history would embody the different ideals of these deific figures, Anatar being one of them, the god of fire and forge. Fucking cool. Hmm. Istvan, follower of Anatar. A foul magic is taking hold here. Ah, well, proving my point even further. So, Mr. Warden, you come back with us? What do you think? Does it seem like I know the bounds of how far I can travel before I am compelled to stay? It's not so much that you're compelled to stay so much as it is you can't seem to find your way away from this place. You always find your way back. Interesting. Alfonso will add, Perhaps our friends, very learned people, may be able to help you with your problem as we navigate the jungle. I think this works out great. Strange. The light from beneath my helm looks down. If I am able to follow you from this place, perhaps this is what this shard calls me towards. But... My oath to the ancients remains. Warden's alluded to it a couple of times now that he's not able to leave this place. So either one of you can roll history on that. 16. On a 16 and a 19, for sure you would associate this with something that both Gallant and Croswell probably would have been talking about the whole time you've been on this expedition. The reason that you have this Mantis Folk guide with you is because Zendrik is a cursed land. And the legend goes that after the fall of the giant empire, the dragons cursed the land with a variety of different curses. But this one in particular is called the Traveler's Curse, named for the Traveler of the Dark Six. And it ensures that no path can be walked the same way twice. But for some reason, these mantis folk are immune to this. And so they have built a little industry around escorting these treasure hunters into and out of the jungle. Got it. That's a cool ass shit. Yeah, it is really cool. I actually love that. Okay, so very well. You come with us. It is very clear to me. I feel it in my bones. This is some sort of curse. And I think we know just the people to help you. Istvan, something tells me he will not be fitting in this. Holding up the bag of holding. Our good friend Warden here. Unfortunately, you will have to walk. So, you set off back towards the camp, 
Go ahead and make a survival check to traverse these ruins. Oh, I think I know what's going to happen here. Survival, that is a 15. 14. Okay. As we walk, I just want to go up to Warden. So, you are a freedom fighter in your time. A interesting way to put it. Istvan, our purpose was to free the countless enslaved elves from under the tyrannical oppression of our giant enemies. It is funny you mention this. I may be no elf, but I know a thing or two about fighting for freedom. Perhaps it is fate brings us together, eh? Perhaps. I just say as I am looking down at this shard in my hand as we walk. And you walk back in the direction of this camp. On those survival checks, you feel that you know which direction camp is, but as you begin to walk back towards it, things look less and less familiar. We lost. And that is where we'll leave this session. Okay. Hell yeah. Very cool. Very Good ass cool. Shit. Pods of the Multiverse is produced by Jimmy Afadigato. That's me. And edited by Scala, with music by Andy Berger, and art by Alexa Riley. Thanks to our Patreon supporters, and a special thanks to our Holy Avengers, May, Jake, Chris, and John. If you're a fan of all the parts of the game that are not actually game and is just us goofing off, for $5 a month on our Patreon, you can access every episode of Table Talk, our post-game recap show. <laughs> oh my god, and there's so much goofing off. Yeah, seriously. Yeah, there is. <laughs> If you want to listen to our Elden Ring podcast, <laughs> if you want to listen to our Magic the Gathering podcast, yeah. if you want to listen to really? our 80s podcast, our Skyrim 80s po- podcast. Oh, yep. <laughs> Did we opine for any length of time about Disco Elysium or was that off mic? <laughs> we came up with our own second podcast called Now That's Podcasting, only to discover it already exists. <laughs> That's right. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> that was a safe it was such a safe bet to say oh if there's a star wars podcast it's probably called now that's podcasting <laughs> now this is podcasting oh Jeff. sorry podcasting in which sorry. we unironically defend the prequels but only against the postquels or whatever they're called requels sequels they're called sequels <laughs> <laughs> oh yeah, I guess that wouldn't change. <laughs> it's still a sequel to six, even though it came. That's fair. Yeah.